I said it before and I'll say it again. If you ever do a video for part five, I will achieve heaven. Who else is here to wait for why you should watch JoJo's Bizarre Adventure Part 5 Golden Wind? Why you should watch JoJo's Part 5? Waiting for the why you should watch JoJo's Part 5. Where the heck is the Part 5 video? And maybe so, you should do your job as an anime YouTuber instead of doing things like wrestling and shit. As if anyone cares about those things. Give it to us right now. No. Okay, fine. Jojo's Bizarre Adventure started off life as a story about a strapping young lad and his quest to defeat his evil vampire brother through the use of magical sunshine karate. It was a fun, weird power fantasy brimming with the eccentricities of its author, Hirohiko Araki, coupled with the man's genuine earnestness for heartfelt storytelling and since then has evolved over multiple successive parts, all of which I have already done a video on, and if you are starting on this one with no knowledge of Jojo, sure, you do you, buddy. But what's been so interesting about making this series is watching Araki's approach to storytelling change with each successive part, so much so that by part five, Golden Winds, Things have changed a lot. Part 5 is unusual in a lot of ways. While the story of the majority of the first six JoJo parts all directly feed into the part that follows, Part 5 is far more isolated, with the events of the story existing as a kind of splinter arc from Part 3, drawing only minimally from the events of Part 4 and having little if any repercussions on the story of Part 6. But Part 5 is also one of my personal favourites, featuring some of the most compelling characters, battles and themes of the entire series thus far. And to explain why that is, we are of course going to start with our brand new Jojo, Journo Giovanna. Jerno is a kind of black sheep of the Joestar family, simultaneously both the son of Jonathan Joestar and mortal enemy Dio Brando, it's weird. The most defining character trait of Jerno is how he's like a combination of these two opposing characters. Like Jonathan, he's capable of incredible kindness and empathy, an empathy that's manifested itself in his power to imbue life to inanimate objects. And also, like Jonathan, is a firm believer in justice and good, causing him to set out on his quest to become a gang star and rid the streets of Italy of its insidious drug trade. But that gentle kindness is also streaked with something much darker. In the face of those he considers evil, that kind empathy will give way to a frigid malice. Unlike previous protagonists, Jerno has no desire to understand or befriend his opponents, nor any reservation about killing his enemies, even treating them with a sadistic brutality. And it's in these moments that Jerno's calm, righteous demeanor subside and we see the traces of Dio that float beneath. It's that duality combined with his calm, reserved nature that makes Jerno an unusual member of the Joestar family, and making him even more unusual is his design. While previous JoJo's protagonists were walking, talking, brick shithouses, Jerno's features are soft and slender. He has these delicate quaffs of curled hair, and from his effeminate pink clothing to his fragile looking stand, everything about his appearance goes against that of his hyper-masculine, power-driven predecessors. Even Jerno's place within his own story seems less significant, with him often taking a backseat to the supporting characters, and you can especially see this in the fights of part 5, with other characters even commenting on Gold Experience's lack of direct physical strength. Instead, Jerno tends to take up more supportive roles in battle, either augmenting the abilities of his allies, taking action that will increase their morale, or healing their wounds. Although technically he's not actually healing them, he's taking objects he finds lying around, turning them into replacement organs, and stuffing them inside his friends. Part 5's really weird. And to show you what I mean here, let's take a little look at the number of battles each Jojo wins in their respective parts. But first, to keep things tidy, here's some qualifiers. 1. Fights have to be actual fights, with momentum swinging back and forth, as opposed to a straight up beating, so Jonathan stomping a bunch of thugs in an alley does not count. 2. I'm only counting fights without significant involvement from any ally of the protagonist. And 3. The victory must be decisive with zero ambiguity, i.e. one party must be incapacitated by its end. And if we take those factors into account, it looks like this. Jonathan wins 7 fights, Joseph wins 5, Jotaro wins 11, Josuke wins 6, and do you know how many Jerno wins? One, a single fight against the automatic stand user Babyface in episode 22. 
You could stretch it to two if you want to count Luca in that, but that guy's special ability is that he owns a shovel and he is more a speed bump than an actual opponent. And what I think is interesting about this is you can see a distinct shift in how Araki uses his protagonists. Jotaro was the center of his own universe, the ultra powerful invincible badass who is the solution to everyone's problems. But that approach softened significantly in part four with the comparatively less powerful Josuke and its increased focus on its supporting cast, with that concept being taken to a logical extreme in part 5. Jerno is not the center of the universe in this story and is far from the invincible badass that Chitaro was. And because of all these factors, I think Jerno lacks some of the immediate appeal of his predecessors. In fact, in a poll I put up on Twitter, out of nearly 11,000 votes, Jerno was voted the least popular Jojo out of parts 2 to 5, with only 13% of the votes, despite part 5 being voted the second most popular part in a previous poll. Now granted, 11,000 people is a relatively small sample size compared to the JoJo fanbase as a whole, and the only people who voted would have been the kind of person who follows me on Twitter, meaning they were all cool and beautiful, but it did give some weight to something I've experienced only anecdotally up until this point, and that is that people tend to be more dismissive towards Jerno as a main character than they do the other JoJos, and on the surface, I get it. He's not as entertaining as Joseph, as badass as Jotaro, or as fun as Josuke. But I also think Think looking at Jerno like this kind of misses the point of his character and in a larger sense part 5 in general. Jerno is not written to exist in isolation but as part of a larger whole. And by giving him a calmer, more subtle nature, reducing both his power and his importance within the story, what it does is allows the supporting cast to step forward and take up those roles. And that's important because part 5 isn't a narrative about any one singular character but a story of relationships. Think about this. The cast of part 3 were all tied together by their mutual goal of destroying Dio. The cast of part 4 by their proximity of living in the town of Morio. And so, the question is what is it that ties the cast of part 5 together? And to begin to answer that, let's take a little trip into Journal's past. Estranged from his father Dio, Journal's mother was forced to raise him by herself, but unwilling to give up her youth, she often abandoned Journo for long stretches of time, leaving the little boy alone, isolated and uncared for, and would eventually even bring a violent stepfather into their home, trapping Journo in a childhood of loneliness, isolation and abuse, until one fateful day when a chance encounter with a member of an organised crime syndicate results in the mysterious man becoming Journo's watchful guardian. An angel, whose unspoken care would pull Jerno from his isolated existence, giving him the strength to grow and become a stronger, better person. This story is not unique to Jerno, but a thread that runs through the lives of each of the supporting cast. Mista, Abaccio, Narancia, and Fugo are all characters who have in some way been abandoned and betrayed by the world around them. From Fugo suffering sexual abuse at the hands of his college professor, to Abaccio being forced out of the police force in disgrace, to Mista's unjust imprisonment over a false self-defense charge. Each one of these characters having at one time lost their place in the world and started on a path that would lead to their ruin. Until, just like Jerno, the kindness of another person pulled them from that path and saved them from that ruin. But unlike Jerno, this time that person would be Bruno Bucciarati. Bruno's parents divorced when he was a young child, and when asked who he would rather live with, he chose to stay with his father, not because he preferred him, but because he knew the man would be unable to cope at the loss of his wife and son, while his mother would likely go on to remarry and have another family. And this is the kind of person that Bucciarati is, filled with empathy and compassion for those around him and particularly those that have been cast off by society. And this is what brings him into the lives of the other characters, finding each one of them at their lowest point and saving them from a life of misery by showing them the love and friendship that's absent from every other facet of their lives, as he gives them new purpose as a member of his squad. Bruno believes in Mr. Fugo, Abaccio and Rancia, he sees the good in them where no one else did, and because of this, they have developed an intense loyalty and affection for him. And so the answer as to what binds these characters together is simple. It's each other. 
While part 4 saw major improvements in Araki's ability to write believable, compelling characters, it's in part 5 when we see him develop the ability to convey the relationships that exist between those characters. Bruno's squad feel like a family, and that's the family that Jerno is brought into after a chance encounter with Bruno, the two discover that they have a shared goal, to expose the dangerous anonymous boss of El Pasión, defeat him and rid the organization of its drug trade once and for all. Setting the group on a journey of battle and espionage across Italy as they attempt to gain the favor of the boss by delivering him his estranged daughter, while also withstanding attack from all sides from the other cells of El Pasión. Where part 5 really starts to come into its own is where this increased focus on relationships begins to change the dynamic of the stand battles. While the first half of the series consists mostly of one-on-one -on -one encounters designed to introduce us to each individual members of the squad, about halfway through that focus shifts to multi-person stand battles. And while Jojo has dabbled in this kind of encounter before, it's never been to this extent or done this well. With our heroes now having to team up to take on teams of stand users or combine their powers to take down one hyper powerful enemy. And where this gets really fun is how different characters abilities can synergize to produce surprising effects, like Jerno imbuing Mista's bullets with life, giving them secondary functions after they've hit their targets. This also means that directly less powerful stands can now become feasible, like Tiziano's talking head, a stand that attaches itself to the target's tongue, causing them to say the opposite of whatever they mean to. Not a powerful ability by itself, but one that becomes very dangerous when coupled with the more directly offensive stands like Squallow's Clash. Talking heads allowing the pair to sow chaos among the ranks of their enemies as their communication is disrupted and they struggle to both understand and communicate how and from where they are being attacked. Squallow and Tiziano show something else about part 5, and that is that the concept of relationships is not just reserved for our heroes, but is also a large part of the enemy stand users. We can tell from how Squallow and Tiziano act around each other that they are most likely romantically connected, a possible reason their stands work so well together being because of the bond that has formed between them. You can see relationships like this everywhere in part 5, and in particular in Risotto's Hitman squad, the enemy group of stand users also attempting to expose the boss. When one of their members is killed, we see the others attend his funeral, and it's a small touch, but it's also like, oh shit, this isn't just a collection of isolated bad guys, but a group of people who genuinely care about each other the same way Bruno Squad does, with there being even more pronounced relationships that exist between its individual members. The implied relationship between Gelato and Sorbet, the weird sub-dom thing going on with Chocolato and Seco, but my personal favourite of these relationships, which also heavily contributes to one of the best fights in all of Jojo, is the fraternal bond between Prosciutto and Pesci. Prosciutto and Pesci are two enemy stand users introduced around the midpoint of part 5, and part of what makes the encounter with them so compelling is their relationship and how it changes the dynamic of the fight. Out of the two, Prosciutto is the veteran, a hardened mafioso who kills as naturally as he breathes. But Pesci, on the other hand, is the younger and less confident of the two, often unsure of what step to take next, and in the eyes of Prosciutto, lacking the resolve of a true gangster a failing prosciutto frequently admonishes him for. The exact nature of the relationship of the two is unclear, Pesci referring to prosciutto as his anarchy, which could mean brother, but could also mean like, bro. But regardless, what's important is that there is actually a warmth between them. While Prosciutto frequently grows frustrated with Pesci, he still believes in his younger anarchy. Prosciutto keen to drive the gangster he knows Pesci can become. While Prosciutto is Pesci's hero, viewing his anarchy with an older brother like awe. And that bond is reflected in their fighting style, Prosciutto using his stand The Grateful Dead to gradually age his opponents. While Pesci attacks more directly with his fishing rod stand, Beach Boy, 
designed to keep attackers at bay, allowing Grateful Dead to slowly eke away their life force from a distance. And these are the tactics that allow the two to pin down Bruno's squad aboard a speeding train. But just when it looks like victory is in sight, disaster strikes and Bershuto is killed, leaving Pesci alone, whose despair awakens within him a new resolve. The loss of his anarchy driving Pesci to become the killer his brother always knew he could be, transforming him into a far more dangerous opponent, which both drives up the intensity of the battle's climax, but also imbues the encounter with a tangible sense of emotion. In the same way Mista and the others believe in Bruno and look up to him, Pesci believed in Prosciutto, and so his loss is a painful experience that foreshadows events to come. And it's this kind of focus on the emotions and relationships of the characters that give the battles of part 5 their heart and edge. The Battles of Part 5 are also where we can see another of the series' major strengths, and specifically the strength of the anime adaptation. This is the reason I felt comfortable leaving Slash Read out of this video title, as the anime does so much to elevate the story of Golden Winds to the point that it's the first time I'd really recommend an anime of Jojo over the manga. Although it should be noted that at this point, Araki's ability to create manga were still developing, with his best work still ahead of him. The anime is beautiful, falling somewhere between the Araki faithful designs of part 3 and the stylistic, saturated pop art of part 4. David Productions doing a fantastic job of translating the complicated designs of part 5 into animated form, while retaining all the harsh line work and thick shadows that make Araki's art style so distinctive. Bringing to life a gorgeous depiction of sun-drenched Italy, the warm, saturated hues capturing the atmosphere and climate of that country beauty. Beautifully. And it's not even just visual, the music is phenomenal. Each stand user now has their own theme music which helps add to their individuality, some of these tracks even directly mirroring that stand user's ability, like how Moody Blue's rewind is conveyed audibly through crunchy VCR distortion. This will sue me. I could talk a lot about all the little touches that make Part 5's anime great. I mean, just look at the insanity happening on screen. This was taken from just four throwaway panels. But what really elevates it to me is how it leverages the strength of animation to bring new life to its battles, and in particular, the stand abilities that drive them. Many of the stand abilities in part 3 were quite simple to understand. A star platinum punches hard, Magician's Red shoots fire, the world stops time, and Death 13 is Freddy Krueger. Most stand abilities can be explained in just a few words, but that complexity increased in part 4, with less direct stands like Lock and Heaven's Door. And by part 5, that complexity has increased even further, with stands like Gold Experience, Notorious B.I.G., and one other that we will get to. The advantage of the anime is it's able to recreate these more nuanced abilities in motion, and thus capture the subtleties of their abilities in a way that is much easier to understand than in a manga. For example, take a stand like Black Sabbath, who is vulnerable to sunlight and whose strength increases when in the shadows meaning that the time of day, position of the sun, and how the shadows are falling are all important mechanics in understanding and appreciating this encounter, but also all aspects that are difficult to convey in the cramped pages of a monotone comic, a problem that the anime avoids utilizing color design, wide open landscape shots, and dynamic camera movement to bring the specifics of this battle to life, and the result is the battle with Black Sabbath comes alive in a way that it just kinda doesn't in the manga. There are multiple examples of this throughout part 5 where abilities and scenarios are easier to comprehend in motion than they are in panels, but none more so than King Crimson. King Crimson is a stand so strange and difficult to understand that it has long made its way into the hallowed halls of Jojo memedom and that was at least until the anime. King Crimson's ability is to erase time, and to explain what that means and to convey how the anime and manga handle it differently, I need to first illustrate how it works without using either, so hello. Let's say King Crimson uses his ability to erase time right as I'm drinking a glass of water. If we break this action down into three segments of time, we can see that there's me raising the glass to my mouth, me drinking the water from it, and me 
lowering the glass. And let's say it's this middle three second chunk that King Crimson decides to erase. Now, from my point of view, I would raise the glass to my mouth and the next instant, the glass would be down by my side with me retaining no memory of drinking the water, just the experience that I was about to and then it was already done. So if we look at this happening on a timeline, what's happening is that King Crimson has essentially erased this middle chunk and slid these two remaining four second chunks together, causing a skip in time that leaves me shocked, confused and open to attack. Where this gets even more complicated is that King Crimson also has the ability to see 10 seconds into the future, allowing him to react to his opponent's actions before they actually happen. Meaning he's basically fucking invincible, using his powers to foresee his opponent's attack, repositioning to an advantageous scenario, delete his opponent's experience of those actions happening, and then striking. As for whether this instant of erase time actually happens, I don't know, it seems like there's two contrasting explanations in the manga and I've watched so many videos on it and I just don't- So let's just ignore that part and focus on both how the manga and anime depict this erasure of time. The problem with trying to show King Crimson's ability through comics is that it's asking us to accept an objective erasure of time in a medium where time is subjective. In other words, whenever we read a comic, a fundamental part of the experience is accepting that we're not just looking at a collection of static images, but a sequence of events. That in between panels, there is a flow of time connecting one action to the next. But whenever King Crimson is in use, we are being asked to disregard this idea and to accept that the only instances actually happening that are being experienced by our characters are the moments of time being expressly shown inside the panels. In other words, deleting the implied flow of time that is happening in between panels, which is so confusing and counterintuitive to how comics work all while simultaneously trying to visually convey King Crimson's ability to see through time. It wasn't impossible to understand, but it was very difficult and led to a large portion of the JoJo fanbase, including myself, having no real idea how King Crimson's abilities work, leading to things like this. All right, you wanna know? Fine, I admit it. I don't know how King Crimson works. He erases time, but what does that mean? It doesn't make any sense. You can't erase time. You can't erase time. Fine, you can freeze time and you can turn back time, but you can't erase time. That doesn't make sense. Why does King Crimson work? Please! Please someone tell me! I need to know how King Crimson works! Ah! This is really not me criticizing Araki's ability to draw comics, as much as it is pointing out one very specific area where the medium of comics is less equipped to convey a concept than a piece of animation. In animation, the problem is far simpler because we now have an objective measure of time that parallels our own. So all we need is a simple jump cut and maybe a sound cue and it's like, bang, we experience the exact skip in time that the characters do without having to go through that dense layer of abstraction that the comic requires. And while still one of the more complicated stand abilities to get your head around, it's infinitely easier to understand in the anime than it originally was. The advantage to this is more than just making a complicated concept easier to understand. A major difference between the battles of part four and those of part five is the level of violence and intensity. For the most part, part four is pretty chilled, where a few notable exceptions aside, battles are the equivalent of high school scuffles, where people rarely die and many of the enemies encountered later return as allies. But this never happens in part five. Part five's combat feels more like violent wars to stay alive. Bruno and his squad sustaining massive life-threatening damage with each passing encounter. They lose limbs, they get shot, and they are constantly snatching each other from the brink of death. The bond between them driving them forward and letting them survive these brutal encounters. And towards the end of the story, it really starts to feel like together they can survive anything. And that is until 
King Crimson. And King Crimson is violence incarnate. King Crimson doesn't really fight, it just kills. His ability allowing him to tear and rip his opponents apart without resistance. And this is the horror of King Crimson, the insurmountable fear he presents. And because of how much more digestible his ability is in the anime, that's a fear that becomes infinitely easier to understand and thus empathize with the insurmountable odds our heroes must face. Driving up the emotional stakes of the encounters with King Crimson and thus his stand user, the main antagonist of part five, Diavolo. And the beautiful thing about Diavolo is that King Crimson is only part of what makes him such a terrifying villain. Diavolo stands unchallenged at the peak of El Pasión, but unlike his subordinates and nearly every other character of Golden Wind, there's one key difference with him. He has no relationships, he has no friends or direct contact with any other human. Rather, he's cloaked himself in a shroud of anonymity, carrying out his commands through intermediaries, meaning no one has any idea what he looks like, where he lives, or is aware of any shred of information about him. Not his subordinates, not his daughter, and to an extent, not even himself. Diavolo existing as one of two alternate personalities trapped in the same body, one of which is a innocent young boy, the other being the psychotic tyrant who maintains control of El Pasión by harvesting fear and terror in every beneath him, and particularly in anyone who would dare attempt to uncover his true identity, as did his subordinates Gelato and Sorbet, with Gelato being sliced into 36 individual segments, encased in glass, and sent to the other members of El Pasión as a warning, with Sorbet being made watch, choking himself to death in terror to avoid the same fate. To Diavolo, a relationship isn't a source of strength, but an open wound that must be sealed. When Bruce Bruno's squad eventually delivers his daughter Trish to him, they're horrified at the revelation that he plans to kill her, and in doing so, severing his final blood link between him and the outside world, allowing him to control El Pasión from the shadows forever. Diavolo forsaking all relationships and intimacy in order to protect himself from the vulnerability that other people bring. And the frightening thing about Diavolo is, I kind of get it. Like, not the killing your kid part, but the other part. Relationships do leave you vulnerable. They are difficult and complicated and painful. People disappoint us. People leave. People die. One way or another, all relationships eventually end. And rather than leave yourself vulnerable to that pain, it can feel easier to just close yourself off and embrace isolation rather than agony. And this is the deeply human fear that Diavolo embodies, and what makes him such a frightening, relatable villain. But this is also the kind of beautiful thing about part five. People will hurt you, people will leave, and you will lose people that you love. But maybe that's okay, because for all the potential other people have to cause us pain, they're also the only thing that really make life worth living. The ones who can pull us from the paths we're on, lift us up, and give us the chance to be better than what we are. And in the light of that, the pain is worth it. Where Diavolo turns away from that pain, Giorno and his friends embrace it, and all the sorrow and happiness that comes with it. This is what I love about part 5. It's still JoJo's, it's still this insane spectacle of superpowered death battles, bananas turning into revolvers, and people shooting ghosts at each other. But it's also this fucking beautiful story about relationships, about how we can find salvation in other people as long as we're willing to accept the pain that comes with that. And I think that's awesome. I think that's why you should watch JoJo's Bizarre Adventure Part 5, Golden Wind.
Hey, MAGFest 2020, guess who's a guest? That's right, it's me! I'll be there from the 2nd to the 5th of January, and all I can say is I have been going to this con for years, and it is such an honor to be invited as a guest. Follow me on Twitter for a full schedule of what I'll be doing, and hopefully I'm gonna see you there. Friends, thank you for joining me today. I know this video was a little earlier than scheduled, and the reasons for that should become obvious a little later this year. I want to thank everyone who supports me on Patreon. Seriously, you guys are so awesome, and I am so thankful that I have the support I do. If you would like to support this channel, you can do so over at patreon.com forward slash super eyepatchwolf. And in particular, this video, I want to thank Micah Ball, Kenshin, Vanessa Ray, Super Slush, Anne Wu, Maria Gallagher, and The Brock. You can also find me hosting the Let's Fight a Boss video game podcast, as well as on Twitter, at iPatchWolf. Friends, take care of yourselves, and I'll see you next time.